Great. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where, wherever you are. Welcome to um, the new climate leadership in finance, the race to zero. Thank you to UNIFI and Responsible Investor for creating this forum um, as part of the Financing a Resilient Future. So, my name is Nigel Topping. I'm the High Level Climate Action Champion for COP26. And I, it's my pleasure to be moderating a session with a, a, a great group um, of speakers and a panel at the end to explore the role of finance in driving the global economy to net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest, the sooner, the better. Um, in my role of high level climate action champion, which was created in Paris, it's my pleasure to work with uh, leaders from the private sector and local government um, and civil society to raise ambition um, and drive action to support governments in being bolder. Um, of course, on the 12th of December this year, we'll have a very important event when the UN Secretary General and the um, Prime Minister of the UK will host the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And we're hoping to see lots of countries step up to make their nationally determined contributions to their climate plans in line with the science and in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, and no sector more important in building confidence for politicians to act um, in um, nudging, encouraging, um, helping um, businesses to invest in the innovations needed to accelerate this transition. Um, no sector more important than the finance sector. So um, I'm delighted to welcome um, a fantastic panel. We've got Pedro Guazo from the UN Pension Fund, and Simpson um, from CalPERS, um, Gunter Tallinger um, from Allianz, also the chair of the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, um, and Bill Winters, the CEO of Standard Charters Bank. So we're gonna, I'm going to turn to the panel in a minute, but really we're here to explore what does it mean for the finance sector to commit to and get to net zero? We'll hear about the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, some of the methodological issues, some of the practical issues of those in fiduciary positions in making the decision to commit and then steer that transition. Um, and then we'll be able to explore um, beyond asset owners, asset managers and banks with the help of Bill, um, what does it mean for the whole of the finance sector to be on the road to zero or as, as, as we say, given the campaign we launched in June, um, to be in the race to zero. Um, so I, I, I want to start um, with a little video um, which we're going to show you about the Asset Owners Alliance. So let me hand back to Mustafa um, and please play the video now and then we'll go with Gunter. our vision and objectives. We are developing a target setting framework. It outlines in a transparent way our approach and principles for how we will contribute to the decarbonization of our economy. Scientific data help us better understand the complexity so I can't of see the video change, playing, so unless somebody tells me that it is playing, then move on. Also, scientific data is essential to have an accurate vision of what we could be facing and adapt our portfolios accordingly. The long-term vision set out by our net zero targets is helping to stimulate and inform short-term action today. The Asset Owner Alliance members start out with changing themselves first and then reach out to various companies to work on the change of their businesses. We want to engage with industry leaders to learn how best to transition we are a strong believer that we are smarter together so that we can successfully achieve our net zero target by 2050. We are a very powerful collective, not only as investors, but also to show leadership. As many, many asset owners join us, the impact multiplies exponentially. And I believe in the power that we have to drive change. Partnerships like the Asset Owner Alliance give me hope. It sets an example of leadership, and it shows the way for business, government, and society to work together to create a more sustainable world.
Let, let's turn straight away to Gunter Tallinger from Allianz. Allianz, of course, one of the founding members of the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, but Gunter, in your role as chair, it'd be great to get an update from you on the progress since launch and the work you're doing on target setting methodologies and what you're hoping to achieve between now and COP26 next year. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Let me link to the video. People may ask, why? Why would an investor accept a target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions? Perhaps even linked to individual compensation. So an investor could certainly listen to science and then understand um, if there is apparently an enormous, perhaps the biggest risk of climate change and the social implications, not only to economies and businesses, but obviously to the assets in a portfolio. And that's a little bit the background of the Asset Owner Alliance. That's why we make this commitment that you have just uh, seen. Since, since the launch of the Asset Owner Alliance, we have been working on approaches to become able to actually steer portfolio towards net zero. One thing that I would quickly like to mention is the whole measurement and then the target setting that is linked to it. Measurement, what does this mean? Well, the greenhouse gas emission impact of an investment portfolio needs to be assessed. And we have been working on an approach to do this. More than 80 experts actually have been working uh, now for the last year. Now we are ready and we are ready to release our approach for public consultation. That's what's actually now uh, happening as of uh, today. And we are looking forward to various experts uh, coming up with their proposals to enhance our approach because we will use that approach to define a first target, what we call an interim target, towards the net zero 2050. We believe such an interim target is enormously important because 2050 is so far out. That target we have seen by looking into our portfolios and using our approach will most certainly lie in the range of 16 to 29 percent greenhouse gas reduction by 2025. So every member of the Asset Owner Alliance is now working on such an individual target. And for those who have tested, we can say 16 to 29 percent reduction is what we will be able to define. That's one area that I wanted to mention. The other area I wanted to talk is how we want to achieve this, the development of assets. It's very important that we need to achieve a change in the economies. So in investors language, this would be something like achieving real world impact. And that needs to be done because otherwise our portfolios are not going towards the net zero. So here we need to have approaches that are based on the science, the scientists' input. We need to have climate models and climate scenarios that we use, and we do so. And with this input, we then define pathways for our individual assets. For directly owned, like real estate, that is actually straightforward. We need to decide on our own to retrofit, to refurbish these assets and get them on the path. For other assets, like for instance, publicly listed companies, we need to reach out to the leadership of these companies to really talk with them about their approach towards sustainability. And here it's important to mention that we are very, very um, interested in, of course, not only working with, but supporting existing initiatives, like for instance, Climate Action 100 Plus, uh, um, where we certainly can cover the biggest emitters, and that's very relevant for our portfolio. We need, of course, to also cover the rest because the total portfolios need to go towards net zero. So that's, that's where we are. We have the target that we can mention now, release for public consultation and will then very well in, in advance of COP26, perhaps relevant for you, Nigel, uh, release our interim targets. That's the status of the Asset Owner Alliance. Let me finish with one thing. We obviously get more stronger with every asset owner. We are now 30, as you have seen. So we really invite other asset owners to make the commitment, consider to really start with changing the asset owner itself, and then reach out to others to support them on the transitioning towards net zero. 
Thanks, Gunter. Um, great to hear about that. Could just, uh, just remind me, how, what are the assets under management of those 30 asset owners now? It's about $5 trillion, right? Yes, right, right, right. That was the big figure in the video. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and what's the timetable of your consultation process? Like when, do, when does the window close? Because you really want to get all the inputs you can, right? Well, we will see now, and uh, let's say by end of the year, we would like to have the input. Yeah? Right. But we will see how experts actually are going into discussion with us. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Gunter. So let's let's now turn from 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 Europe um, to to North America um, to bring in uh, Anne Simpson from Calpers, of course, the US's largest pension fund. Um, and Anne, it'd be great to hear um, a bit about the you know the conversations within the, within uh, amongst trustees and how you came to the decision to be one of the founding members, and then maybe tell us your story about how you turn that to to targets and then specific measures that, that you're taking as a as a fund. Yeah, and you're on mute, Anne. No, you're still on mute. Okay, how's that? Fantastic. We, we hear you loud and clear, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> did, Anne, thank did, you, you. Did, you, did you hear my question? Yes, I did. Great, thank you, um, Anne. And, and I apologise for the overly dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, this isn't me being theatrical. Um, so first of all, uh, congratulations to, to the, everybody involved in the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. I think this is a very exciting initiative. Why does this matter? It's because if you don't set a target, you'll never get to where you need to go to. So uh, CalPERS, as you rightly said, Nigel, <clears throat> I think we were the first US asset owner to join. But what's important about this initiative is it's looking at um, emissions right across the portfolio. So if you look at CalPERS, where we, we have something in the order of $420 billion to invest, we've got to make sure that we're and earning investment returns, not just for the next year, 10 years, decades, we're an intergenerational investor. So even if you close the doors in the morning for CalPERS, we have to keep investing for the best part of a century. And what we've done is identify that climate risk is one of the top three risks to our system. And that's because it not only poses a systemic risk, in other words, a risk that we can't hide from, we can't diversify our way out of. It's a risk we have to tackle at source, but it's also a huge opportunity. And I know that with um, the doom and the gloom and the risk focus on climate, we're really missing out on a lot of uh, the discussion about the opportunity for shared prosperity, for the just transition. And that is as much part of CalPERS concern uh, is the opportunity side, not just the risk management. So we think for investors, there are, uh, there are three things that we need to do. Um, obviously, the, the, the first is, as, as Gunter said, it's engagement. We own the assets that are the source of the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is where the initiative Climate Action 100 Plus um, is, is going to be working very closely, arm in arm, uh, with the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. And just to give you a sense of the scale here, those 100 companies in that uh, initiative, if they were a country, they'd be the third largest source of emissions on the planet. We go China, United States, and then just 100 companies. So we don't have to boil the ocean, as the Americans say. We can be very, very focused as the owners of these companies. And we have, uh, I think, Gunter, we're up to something like 50 of those companies now have net zero asset, uh, sorry, net zero targets by 2050. And this is across the very hard to abate sectors, cement, oil, gas, utilities, energy, agriculture. The second thing we need to do is not just engage, we need to be advocates. That means we need to be loud and clear with policymakers and regulators on the rules of the game that we need that are going to make, uh, make it possible for the money to flow where it's needed. Number one, uh, mandatory climate risk reporting. So 
for CalPERS, we're great supporters of everything that's happening with the International Accounting Standards Board. We're very happy that the UN's Global Investors for Sustainable Development, which CalPERS is part of, their report recommendations to the EU are saying the same thing. And likewise, um, my colleague Divya Mankikar has been sitting on the uh, CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission in the United States, which has just said we need mandatory risk reporting. So there's a lot happening there. We also really need to get carbon pricing sorted out because the economics are, you know, skew whiff if we don't price that externality. So you're going to find the financial markets can really um, not only request, but require the transition from companies, but they're going to have to get these risk reporting and carbon pricing elements in place. That's the policy makers. And then finally, uh, for CalPERS, the third, third leg of our strategy is integration. And that's to make sure that across all of our asset classes, as Gunter said, we're using um, uh, the lens of risk and opportunity on climate change across all of our asset classes. So we've helped develop a new uh, risk mapping tool called PROC, the physical risks of climate change is effectively zip code risk. So we can start looking at the physical risk, but also uh, analyzing at a fundamental security level, the transition risk, for example, through our global fixed income portfolio. So to finish, um, as Gunter said, the goal of this initiative is not that we have a portfolio that uh, looks good or um, seems green. The purpose here is to get the real economy in line with the Paris goals. So we've got an opportunity as the providers of capital and the stewards of capital, as advocates with regulators and policymakers, but also in the integration process um, of how we assess risk. Um, so congratulations to the launch of the consultation. We're very excited about this work. And uh, as Gunter said, a warm welcome to all others who'd like to join. Thanks, Nigel. Great, thank you, Anne. I think you've beautifully described how um, there's just a very straightforward fiduciary reason um, for yeah. a asset owner um, with your long-term liabilities, um, in many ways already to future generations, you know, given that you, you have to um, know that you're going to be paying out that, that, that young firefighter who, who joins the pension scheme at right. 20 today. Um, and that there's, there's a very real, real economy risks. And we know that, as you say, macroeconomically, we know that the case is very clear for acting. That, Thank you. That, 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 that's really clear. I want to, now. So, the, the, so this is asset owners, okay? Now, but the, the asset owners um, have huge power because, in a sense, you can dictate or influence what asset managers do and what companies um, in your portfolios do. Um, but I want to talk now, turn now to, to Bill Winters uh, from Standard Chartered Bank. Um, you know, one of the first international banks to commit to transitioning its full loan book. So it's a different challenge, another key part of the finance community. But Bill, um, tell us about the, um, the rationale from, as, a, as a banker for taking this step. And what do you see as the, the what's the progress we're making um, with this uh, UNFI collective commitment to climate action for banks towards having a, a group of banks with a robust uh, methodology? Um, so what, why and, and what's, the, what's, what's the progress we're making? And particularly, what are the differences between a bank and an asset asset owner, as we just heard from? Yeah, well, look, Nigel, great, great, uh, great set of questions, and I, I really enjoyed listening to Gunter and Anne. Uh, yeah, obviously, at the at the the, the, the closest to the uh, to the money that's being invested in uh, in the things that are, as, as Anne said, are the, the owners of the assets that are emitting. Uh, now, banking is uh, is in many ways in the same position. So we have we've had a, a very clear focus on. The, uh, the clients of ours that are themselves the largest emitters, and we have uh, we have a different kind of influence than, than an owner would. We have the influence that a lender has, but that uh, or, or or a provider of advice or a, uh, or whatever. But that's uh, it, it's it's uh, nevertheless quite an influential position, and we we do have discretion over what goes on our books and, and what doesn't. Uh, but we are also owned, uh, so uh, we're we're in that Calvary portfolio. At least I hope we're in that Calvary portfolio. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and we're in that Allianz portfolio, etc. And and that um, that, that uh, brings uh, a, a a bit of pressure that comes from the, the people that own the assets of the of the people that are emitting. Uh, so so I think we we have a perspective from both sides. Uh, but w the way we look at this, and and I I, I think you find that that uh, uh, that many banks uh, are doing this the same way these days, uh, is that uh, we have a number of stakeholders. Uh, our owners are clearly uh, one group of stakeholders. Uh, when it comes to uh, to climate action, until recently. I would say our, our employees uh, were a, a, a more impactful stakeholder on us. I'd say more recently, 
largely, I think, as a result of, of the actions of people like Gunter and Anne, uh, our shareholders have become much more vocal uh, about what they expect. Uh, but, but well before that happened, uh, we, we felt uh, an obligation as members of society, like Standard Chartered is a global bank, but we're anchored in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. So uh, we're sitting in, in our markets, which are both are and are likely to be most affected by climate change and first affected by climate change, and also in the markets where uh, some of the biggest emissions problems uh, exist. So you know, this, this has been a, a recognized and acute problem for us for some time. Uh, our employees, our clients, uh, our shareholders, our creditors uh, all have <laughs> us doing the right thing. Uh, I'd like to think that we got there uh, before any of, them, uh, any of them pushed us there. So like back in, the, in 2018, uh, we made so, some very clear commitments around uh, measuring, managing, and reducing emissions. Uh, easy to say, hard to do. The, the, the measurement challenge, especially when you're getting into the uh, measuring the impact that the <clears throat> has on, on carbon emissions, uh, which is obviously different than the themselves. So measuring uh, is a challenge. We've, uh, we we, we uh, convened and are continuing to convene and participate in different fora uh, with, a, with the task of really understanding what do our activities, let's just say, for example, financing an airplane. Uh, what is our contribution to the, to the carbon chain uh, through that transaction? Uh, providing financing for a, a, a solar plant that will replace a coal-fired power plant. Providing financing for, uh, for an upgrade of an existing coal-fired plant. Now, that's something that Standard Chartered uh, said uh, at the same time that we will no longer do. We don't finance coal-fired power plants in any form. Uh, we also made clear that uh, we will uh, work with our clients between 20 and 20 and 2030 uh, who are dependent on coal uh, for their for their income stream. More than 10% is a threshold that we set. Uh, and we will exit those clients uh, at the end of, of that period if, we, uh, if they haven't made the progress to become uh, non-dependent on coal. Now, these are, uh, th th there's a stick in there, but there's also a carrot as well. So we, we put together financing packages uh, that are uh, specifically targeted at sustainable financing. Uh, we've committed to, to, to put out about, you know, put out or facilitate $35 billion of sustainable financing over the next five years. So that's the, that's the carrot, but there, there's a stick. And uh, I think what we found is that it, it, it's important uh, for us to be very clear uh, about what, uh, what our criteria are, what our measures are, uh, to, uh, to manage those ourselves. So of course we manage our own carbon emissions, uh, net neutral, net, net zero by, uh, by 2030, uh, but that's small compared to the, the emissions that, that we're connected to in terms of, of what we finance or, or, or help finance. Uh, so uh, we want to, our clients to understand our direction of travel very clearly. We set some very clear uh, metrics, uh, some very clear uh, uh, objectives slash requirements, and then we work with them. And uh, now, while in, in, in the early stages, so I say back in 2017 and 18, when we were discussing this concretely with clients who didn't meet the criteria that we set today, uh, the initial reaction was exactly what you would expect, which is, come on, you've been our bank for 150 years or 50 years or 15 months or whatever. Uh, how can you tell us that you would walk away from us if we don't uh, meet your arbitrary standards? It's okay. These aren't our arbitrary standards. Where we've tried very closely to link this to the agreements that uh, governments made in, in the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have our own course to plot uh, as it relates to, to our bit of meeting those commitments. And you either need to come along with us or we can't work with you. But we'll have plenty of time to work through this. Now, that was the initial reaction. I can say within months... Uh, our clients had shifted their focus to, okay, how can we get this done? Because by the way, we're hearing the same thing from our owners or our governments or our customers uh, or, or the, the communities in which we operate. So uh, I, I think we quickly, quickly moved from, you know, why are you being so hard on us to how can you help us to deliver the commitments that we ourselves uh, are wanting to make? So uh, I, I think... Uh, I, I thank you for, for noting that Standard Chartered was uh, was early on this game, and I think we intend to to continue to be uh, as, as far as close to the front of the pack as we can be, if not at the front of the pack. Uh, and uh, that, that's part of our commitment to be uh, the world's most sustainable and responsible bank. You know, so that's, that's, that's a big ambition. We've got a lot to deliver on that. Uh, but there are lots of big things that we can do, and there are lots of very specific things. So, uh, for example, I've uh, I've taken on a role. Uh, working with, with colleagues at Standard Trotter, but also with COP26 and, and uh, uh, McKinsey, and, and a, a fabulous group of 50 uh, companies that are across the carbon spectrum, so uh, emitters, uh, offsetters, and, and intermediaries, to try to make the, the voluntary carbon market a much more robust market. Uh, our, our estimate is that we'll need to increase the, the size of the carbon market by possibly as much as 160 times bigger than it is today if we're going to hit the 1.5 degree target that we set. 
the objective is to harness the power of private markets, uh, to, to exactly as I think I heard from, from Ann and Gunter, which is to harness the power of private markets to, to, to have a robust uh, offset market that can help companies like Standard Charter and our clients to meet the commitments that they've made. Anyway, more to come on that one. Uh, but uh, thanks again for having me and look forward to the rest of the chat. Uh, thanks, Bill. And I, I love the way you describe all the different stakeholders. Uh, I mean, you could say ganging up on, on, on company or ganging up on you, but I would, I, or you might say aligning. So, you know, owners, employees, um, clients. Um, I think that's, that's a really common theme. Though. Like, we, you know, we always tend to focus on one lever and then it turns out that suddenly everyone wakes up and everyone's going in the same direction, which is also one of the things which will allow us to make the kind of exponential change, for example, to 160x the carbon markets. Great. Thank you. Let's, um, I want to turn now to, to Pedro Guazzo um, from the UN's Joint Staff Pension Fund, another Asset Owners Alliance um, uh, member, another net zero committed asset owner. Um, Pedro, the, you, you know, this is a, it's a government-backed institution, um, government-related. Tell us a little bit about what's different and what the prospects are for other um, government employee and even sovereign wealth funds to commit to net zero and join the, join the 30 asset owners who are already in the alliance. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for, for the invitation. And it's uh, impressive to see, to, to follow everything that has been said. So we have just some things to, to add. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, climate change or climate action is part of our DNA, right? And our DNA, if you want, is the sustainable development goals. And chromo chromosome 17 of the sustainable development goals is climate action, right? And that is what, what we love about that, uh, that goal is the word action, uh, because we all have to do something. Uh, from our perspective in the, in the pension fund, with the pension fund of the staff of the United Nations, we manage $75 billion. And in our governing body, we have, of course, representation from member states, from staff, and from the UN organizations. And all our stakeholders have been asking us to do something about climate change, right? To go net zero. Uh, what we have done over the last years is, with all the limitations that we have, as you as you know, being part, and I think that uh, a lot of uh, of the government-related uh, asset owners or government sponsored asset owners sometimes we don't have the flexibility of creating the incentives for our investment officers to do things like this now i was i was listening to to gunter on on putting the incentives out there the economic incentives and the sticks we don't have many of those however what we have is the possibility to educate and to train and to give the conscience to our people that is the right thing to do because it's a stakeholder's request and because it's the right thing to do because it's in our DNA. Just to give you some, uh, some, some numbers, even without, because when, when, when it comes to make the, the investment from an asset owner perspective, our investment officers, they have their benchmarks that they have to comply with, right? And those benchmarks sometimes they're included, these, uh, these fossil fuel companies, if you want. We haven't, even without limiting what they can invest in, what we have seen is that by now, we have in our portfolio just around 2% of investment in fossil fuels, while we have investments in sustainable energies of something around 6% of our portfolio. And that is only based on the analysis and the conviction of all our portfolio managers that investing long-term in sustainable energies is more profitable than investing in other type of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of assets, right? And that goes to the question that most of the investors are asking in their heads, right? They don't see or they're not convinced about their return because after all, we have to give a return to our portfolio, right? Our fiduciary responsibility is to bring returns to that portfolio in the long term that is sustainable. And the question is, is it as sustainable or as profitable to invest in clean assets as it is to invest in other type of assets? And the question is, yes, no, it is sustainable. There's a there's research that in the long term it's uh, it's even probably more profitable to invest in clean energies, and that's the power that we have as asset owners. No, the more money we put in the 
clean energy in the clean uh, assets in the clean companies it will become more profitable right so it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy if we put the money in the right place it will bring us the right type of, of, of return, right? So we're committed. We're very happy to see that the, the framework was uh, was issued because we believe that having a standard way of measuring each other will allow us to benchmark ourselves, but also to create a joint standardized goal and uh, interim goals that we all have to achieve and we all have to contribute, right? That is the power that we have as asset owners. And as Gunther said, the more asset owners join us, will give us more power to drive that car uh, into the right direction. Great. Th thank you, Pedro. And thank you in particular for pointing out this trap that still some people falling into of, of, of adopting a framing that assumes that investing in the transition to a cleaner economy means um, a sacrifice on returns. Um, I, I know from my experience as a trustee of the London Pension Funds when we worked hard to decarbonize that portfolio, that that was often the mindset amongst asset managers or amongst people who've been in the industry for a very long time. I know all, all of you are challenging that mindset and proving that it's not the case, but there's still some work to be done. Okay, so look, we've got, we've got about 10 minutes left. We're just gonna um, um, throw a few questions at the, at the panel. I'm just gonna ask you, Literally to wave your hand if you want to take the question, and then I'll and I'll, and I'll just I'll, I'll just point. Um, I, look, I, I, we've heard um, a lot. There's been a lot of publicity around um, divestment. You know, there's a big campaigning movement to divest. You've all you've all talked in different ways about using financial levers and engagement. Can you just just tell us how do you navigate that? The, the, you know that the difference between you know when is when is engagement toothless. You know, how do you, how do you, you know, when does engagement work? How do you navigate that, the difference between, you know, I mean, Pedro, you say you're down at 2% fossil fuels. I think fossil fuels have just fallen down to 2% in the um, in S&P 500 anyway, because they've, the value of those stocks has declined. So, you know, how, how do you make that choice about where, how long to hang in there trying to um, nudge, help, build? You had your hand up. So, so maybe some thoughts from you on that and then, and then Anne. Start with Pedro. Uh, I'm, I'm no, to start. No, Bill first, and okay, then Anna. Yeah. And then oh, I didn't see Pedro. Did you? If you have your hand up, then wave again. Okay. Yeah, my, so Bill uh, and Pedro. The, the divestment obviously means a different thing for a bank uh, than it would for an asset manager. Uh, uh, for us, it means uh, ceasing activities or stopping lending. Uh, we have the advantage of, of typically being an insider in these companies, so we can we can uh, get uh, access to their plans uh, as we also give them access to our, our criteria for the continuing business. That's exactly what we've done. And uh, to, to my mind, having a, having a plan to help a company to go from being a, a substantial carbon emitter to being a much less substantial carbon emitter is, is how we can crack this problem. Us simply exiting uh, may have the effect of, of uh, in, over some period of time, putting some companies out of business, uh, but they're likely to be picked up someplace else uh, after debt restructuring. So it's, it, it, there's no benefit to, to, uh, to, to, to the climate cause. Whereas working with these companies, using our financial tools, advice, et cetera, to, to reduce their emissions is, is, the, is the right way to go. Now, some companies won't be able to make it and we'll, and we'll have to exit, but I think that'll be a very small proportion. I, I admire your optimism, Bill. I think the history of industrial transformation suggests that there'll be, there'll be a little bit more blood on the walls than that. Um, but let, 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 Anne, let's go, go to you. How, do you. how do you navigate that? You're on mute, Anne, sorry. Sorry. Uh, no, this issue about divestment is a really important topic. But what bothers me is that if the if, if the goal is to bring emissions down, um, divestment is a very messy and indirect way to have an impact. So let me give you an example. Let's pretend, you know, Gunter, Bill, uh, Pedro, all of us decide it's time to uh, to divest. Well, the first thing is, which part of your portfolio are you going to sell? Because it's it's all very well saying oil and gas, these are the, uh, the fossil fuels. Um, exactly as you said, Nigel, we found that our exposure to, to that as a sector has, has collapsed to something very small. And that's because of the wider, um, you know, the secular economic impact on, on, the, on, on the energy sector. We've also found, much like Pedro said, you know, in our private asset classes now, nearly 20% of our assets are in what you'd call climate solutions, you know, renewables, water storage, energy efficiency. So 
all of this economic impact is rolling through. But if I sell my shares in a company, or CalPERS does, uh, and just sell them to another investor, because it doesn't affect the company. It doesn't take money away from the company. This is a secondary market. Now, the financing, uh, as Bill was saying, you know, through through the bank sector, yes, that's a more direct form of money into a company. But we've got to use our position of ownership to drive the transition, not to request, but to require that these big emitters make the transition. If we walk away, the very big universal owners like CalPERS, we are still exposed to climate risk because those emissions continue to uh, increase global warming. And there's nowhere for us to hide. So we've got to roll our sleeves up and get involved in the dirty business of uh, the, the energy transition. But there's also a huge amount of opportunity along the way. Selling your shares simply means someone else bought them. And you have no guarantee whether that uh, that investor will make so, uh, so will similar, make decisions. So similar to Bill, it's like it's not like simply selling, I think was the phrase that Bill said, or simply divesting is, is a crude and perhaps ineffective instrument. But engaging, engaging with teeth is, I think, what I've heard you both saying is that if the plan isn't serious enough, there has to be a, I mean, there has to be a point. Otherwise, it's a, so there has to be a point where you decide, actually, this, these guys aren't going to make it, as you said, Bill. Well, it, exactly. And that's the logic behind, I mean, the reason investors get stuck on these issues is we only own a tiny little piece of everything. You yeah. know, that's modern portfolio theory. We are diversified to the point where it's very hard it's what bob monks calls reckless prudence you are <laughs> reckless because you have tried to prudently distribute all your holdings which means you can't do anything so the way we overcome that tragedy of the commons is by coming together and right. that's what climate action 100 plus is all about the reason we're getting these net zero commitments is and the other funds in this call are all members and they're part of this the reason we've got 50 companies of these biggest emitters in the world to commit to net zero by 2050 is because we're close to you know we're heading towards the 50 trillion dollar mark so we've got to work together and recognize that this money in the financial markets is the common wealth. These are the savings of ordinary working people who need to harness the common wealth to the common good. So, you know, the financial sector is not money floating off uh, yeah. owned by remote people in Wall Street. This is everybody's money. So let's get it <coughs> moving. I, right I, I, love, I, love, I love the idea of the reckless prudence that, that by, by taking prudence to its extreme, you, you actually, we actually lose yeah. control, yeah. Lose, yeah. A, lose agency, and then you need to actually come back together to, re, to yeah. rebuild the global commons. Lovely. And, and Pedro, quick, quick word from you, and then I want to ask um, Gunter for a closing thought on how um, asset owners can influence governments. But Pedro, to you first on the divestment engagement question. Yeah, just very quick, uh, because I think that uh, I fully agree with what Bill and Anand has said, and that is, the, that is the power of working together, because we have such small, such small portions, each one of us, that we really, our engagement alone is not enough, so we have to work together. You know? And then it comes the, the, the logistics part of it. Even if you would like to divest everything today, you cannot, right? Because I mean, if, if you're if you're talking about a stock that it's uh, that, that that it's uh, uh, quoted in uh, in a stock exchange, you you could do it immediately. But don't, sometimes we invest through vehicles that it's really difficult to to sure. divest from, right? But uh, but yeah, the power of, of being together is the is the most important one. And that's great. Yeah. Thank you, Pedro. I just just quickly, I mean, one one thing is that um, uh, Anne talked a bit about advocacy. Um, can you just say something about how you think the finance sector could <clears throat> contribute most to mobilising governments to be more ambitious? You know, we have this um, ambition moment on the 12th of December, then we have a whole year to still um, encourage governments to come forward with more ambitious climate plans. How can the finance sector most usefully mobilise governments? Well, I would say there are two things to it. One, one thing is, uh, indeed, you need to clearly signal that you are kind of in the same boat. You, you need to make clear that this is very much in your interest. And uh, obviously, we are always investing for uh, return. But if we have a net zero orientation, then governments should understand they can really uh, consider us a partner. <coughs> and then, then there are, uh, let's say, two content points. Both were mentioned by Anne already, but I want to repeat them. It's really very important that mandatory climate impact reporting is introduced. It's very important. You need to have the basis to understand what the climate impact per company is. 
And the other thing is, we need to talk about carbon price because otherwise we always will have some, some bottom feeders uh, that come up with some arbitrage transactions and it's very, very difficult in certain jurisdictions, let's say if a steel producer in, in, the EU, to come, in the European Union to come up with a completely different approach to produce steel if there is no protection. These two things can be discussed by us as investors with governments and then governments can certainly uh, start to think about that context because they see the investors really too. Okay, great. Thank you, Gunther. I'm sorry we're running out of time. This is, this is fantastic to, to learn from all of you. Let me just try and wrap, wrap things up um, uh, and then um, I think what I love about this conversation is it's, it's predicated on the very straightforward assumption that the zero carbon economy is inevitable. And that there's, no, there's no question of that. It's a question of how do we skillfully navigate that. Clearly, asset owners with this sort of intergenerational responsibility um, and this whole of economy um, exposure must manage carbon risk. And I love that idea, Gunter, that you're in the same boat as governments in that sense. Um, I think we've heard that bold targets are needed to drive innovation. If you don't have a target and said, then there's no chance that you'll achieve it. Um, also, Pedro's um, talked about how we break the trade-off framing from assuming that um, uh, investing in the clean new economy is going to um, uh, have a negative effect on, on, on returns. Um, it's great to hear about the momentum of the Asset Owners Alliance and that you're now in this consultation phase. So I'd urge everyone to join in that consultation so that the methodology for target setting is as robust as possible so that everyone can join it. Um, I, I think also we've really heard a lot about the, the, the power of collaboration on Climate Action 100 Plus, on the Asset Owners Alliance, on other things to, if you like, reconstruct the global commons to overcome the, the challenge of reckless prudence. I love that idea, man. Um, really clear message about the power of advocacy, um, the importance of TCFD. I think big shout out for me there is the danger of over simple scenarios. I th think for me, the one scenario that people really need to um, measure against is the um, inevitable policy response, the kind of linear cliff edge. Um, and then we've heard um, from Bill about the different influence that banks have, but the crucial role um, they have uh, as sort of inside advisors in managing that transition. Um, so with that, I'd like to close. Thank you everyone for joining us and urge everyone to join these alliances and join the race to zero. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.